Welcome to Equipping the Corps. Someone I know once said, seconds are hours on the battlefield, especially when it comes to the low altitude air defense community. The Marine Air Defense Integrated System, or as we call it MATIS, is the Marine Corps' newest asset in counter unmanned aircraft systems operations and brings the Corps one step closer to air dominance. Joining me today is Gunny Sergeant Matthew Ross, the MATIS Inc. 1 Training SME and Assistant Project Officer. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and excited to uh, to talk about uh, what we're going to talk about today, specifically the program that I'm on. So I'm excited to learn more about the LAD community. I didn't know much about it, honestly, until I went to the the event. So. Yeah, yeah. Not many people know about it because it's you know it's a very small community, and it's funny because a lot of Marines out there don't even know we exist. So when they come across you and they're like, "Hey, you know, what do you do?" You're like, I'm a lad gunner. They're like, what is that, right? Like, is that a door gunner on a Huey? Like, I have no idea. So it's pretty cool. And then they find out and they're like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, They're like, it's super cool. And I'm like, yeah, um, obviously it's funny in the Marine Corps because everybody thinks that your job is the coolest. Yeah. But then you think their job is the coolest. So it's it's, it's a cool dynamic. If only you could just like do little rotations and do everyone's job at one time, that would be fun. Yeah, that would be phenomenal. I mean, I've had an opportunity, but we'll get into yeah, that. Yeah, I've yeah. had an opportunity to do many cool things. So My my little joke that I have to throw in, has anyone, has anyone ever called you a little lad? A little lad. And I like <laughs> it. I like it. No, no. A lot of people accuse us of laying around all day. Laying around. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. We yeah. do love an acronym. We do love an acronym. Absolutely. Um, for those of us who don't know, what is MATIS? So MATIS is, uh, as it sits, and what MATIS stands for is Marine Air Defense Integrated Systems. So basically, it's a, uh, a platform with kinetic and non-kinetic capabilities to basically deter or defeat any type of unmanned aerial system as well as fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft. So with that being said, uh, because it's on a platform and it's on a vehicle, what we really need to focus in on is crew composition, how to work together as a team to achieve our kill chain. Um, You said fixed wing and rotary wing. So for anyone who doesn't know the difference, can you talk to that? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, uh, the way the easiest way you can break it down is is fast movers and slow movers, right? So okay. anything with a rotary wing or rotary aircraft is going to move a little slower than a you know than a fixed wing. A fixed wing is going to be like your jets, um, depending on what you know jet that is uh, and the capabilities of that. We have systems that will easily uh, take care of you know whatever we need to take care of, depending on the mission set. How is Mattis leading, currently leading, or will be leading the way in air defense? So specifically when it comes down to the Marine Corps, we are the last line of air defense in regards to the Marine Corps as a whole. Okay. So if you think about like the Army's capabilities, the the Army really has a lot of different missiles, uh, different systems that go from anywhere from high altitude to low altitude to include some of the systems that we use now. But they also cover a much bigger footprint and their their mission set is a little different than ours, right? Uh, whereas we are the only line of air defense in the Marine Corps, essentially from ground to air. Uh, and that is where, you know, we come into play. Big job. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even if you look at our sustainability aspects and what we currently do, uh, it would 100% play a vital role in the protection of our own troops and our own assets on the ground uh, based on the capabilities of, of what we do with, you know, what we have now as a weapon system, which is our Stinger missile. So we are the world's best hide and seek players. As it sits now. Now with Mattis, that that basically opens up a wide array of different capabilities, one that we have, but it's also it also enables us to be integrated in a lot more mission sets and uh, areas of opportunity to where we're much more dynamic in the role of air defense, specifically covering anything from fixed wing and rotary wing 
all the way down to the lowest level UAS. So it's a multifaceted capability that we need uh, and that we're, we're thankfully going to have as a community to provide that protection, you know, eyes in the sky, no matter what the size and capability of the adversary has, that the adversary has, right? The fact that it can go after small and large is great because normally it would be two different, I would assume two different systems, one for like the larger rotary, fixed rotary wings, and then one for the drones. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, you know, specifically when it comes down to Mattis and this program is we're, we're extremely multifaceted. So if we're talking about the way we operate now, then yeah, I mean, we have assets that will aid us uh, in the completion of counter UAS 100%. But taking something like this and having a, uh, a focused system, if you will, or a system of systems to provide us with the same end state as, as fast as a, a click of a button to switch, you know, switch weapon systems, like that is massive growth and massive capabilities for us uh, on the battlefield. You mentioned that the LAD community is a small community, but, and you're the training SME for that community. Um, what does that entail? Yeah, so right now my roles in uh, Marine Corps CISCOM, I'll uh, give you some background on it. Uh, I know we're going to talk about my career a little bit towards the end here, but I essentially got brought over from an advanced formal school setting where okay. I understand how to teach Marines. Now, it, it's beautiful what we do at CISCOM, right? We create these, these systems that the Marines, you know, have to be able to uh, execute their mission with. So if you really think about that, what is the most important, right? The most important is the Marines and how the Marines get trained in order to use those systems, right? And you take it down to the lowest level. So that's where my passion lies. Okay. Um, but more specifically, as the Mattis training SME, that means that I need to be the subject matter expert in every piece part component of this system and translate that to the fleet or the Marines attending new equipment training. Like, hey, this is how we are going to accomplish the mission. So really, I, you know, I have a pretty excessive workload when it comes down to learning, especially a system this complex, right? Um, but it's beautiful. I love the challenge. Um, and being, being, a, being in that vital role, which I do believe that position is a vital role, it enables more feedback from those Marines that are attending that training. And it also develops the system. So it's kind of like a hand-in-hand -hand relationship, if yeah. you will. So CISCON comes like we did with, with Mattis. We put together all these piece, piece parts components and then we're like, hey, we're going to send our team to learn. And that's where I really started off, right, is I started to uh, take my net new equipment training instructors, my field service representatives who work on the system, uh, my engineers, my logisticians, and I look through the contracts I find the training clin, I contact the vendor, I set up that training, I coordinate that training, and I also attend it. So that way I'm getting the resident knowledge and experience yeah. on that OEM part. But we're also preparing the team to teach the Marines. So once those individuals are prepared, they teach the Marines, the Marines come back with that operational perspective and go, okay, I see this as, as something that is, is vital for our community and how I can utilize it. Or they can come back and be like, Hey, like I cannot operate this system because of this, so I need that changed. So it's a it's a constant, I would say, storm phase, like a beautiful storm phase, like an iterative process where you can go and make the changes as y'all are doing the training. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. or updates, I should say. Or, yeah, and then, yeah, and then the 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 fielding is kind of the calm of the storm. Yeah, right. It's like okay, now you have it. You've got what you, and and nothing is ever going to be perfect, right? No, but that is that is. A, Exactly what fills that gap is the Marines' knowledge, training, and experience, as well as their leadership in order to implement what they are receiving. Uh, so it's a hand-in-hand -hand relationship. My role is the pickle jar, right, as, uh, as the training's me. Like, how do I emphasize on the fleet 
right, to be proactive in the way they're operating now. Because, I mean, anybody that knows about the LAD community, we come from, you know, passive air defense, stinger missiles, like very, very baseline operations to, to include joint operations, you know, the more experience you have. However, it's apples and oranges. When you bring you know, in when, when you bring in Mattis. Yeah. And it's the same, it's the same mission. It's just different new equipment and a new breakdown of how we employ those systems. So when you go and do net, is that only, are we only training the LAD community, I'm going to assume, to be able to use Mattis? So we have our 7212s, which is what okay. I am, our low okay. altitude air defense gunners. And then we have our 59 community, which is basically our maintainer community. Okay. So they work a lot with CAC2S and, and, and different, uh, you, a control agency maintainer, if you will. Um, due to the complexity of our new system, we are now, uh, I, I'm trying to say like, basically hand in hand with the 59 community, which I think is phenomenal, right? You have that uh, ground level expertise of air defense, and then you also have that maintenance level expertise of command and control. Okay. Because um, it, it all comes together. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the cool thing is, is, and I think this is a kind of like a new day and age thought process in my opinion, right? A little leaning away from the archaic aspects is we work together hand in hand and in either way, we're all Marines. Yeah. And when it comes down to crew composition, having a, you know, having 59s and 72s work, work together to complete one mission, I think is, is extremely exciting uh, and makes us that much more capable. It's the same mission. Yes, yeah. exactly. I would also assume that the vehicle operators, are those involved in training at all? Or would the Marine driving, let's say the JLTV, is that a separate? So They would go through net training for JLTV, not necessarily Mattis. So th this is the cool part about where we are now. And I guess I'll talk on that a little bit. Okay. Now that you, you know, now that you bring it up. Historically, lad gunners have not only you know, done their, their primary mission, which is low altitude air defense, right? Which is ground-based air defense. They also have to, you know, just like I was, you know, when I joined the Marine Corps, I had to get my Humvee license through the training pipeline, okay. right? At the schoolhouse. And then I roll over into my main MOS to include learning how to operate and have gross familiarity with operating a medium and heavy machine gun. Right. Is and that just those. for the LAD community or is that all Marines? I really can only speak on behalf of the LAD community okay. because that's the only thousand thousand level training pipeline that I've gone <laughs> you, through you, for a primary yeah. MOS. I don't believe so. I mean, a lot of Marines are extremely multifaceted, right? A lot of communities are extremely multifaceted. Like what is what is one of the key components to any successful business uh, or, you know, war fighting organization, I mean, across the board or relationship communication, right? So we also learn how to utilize our communication yeah. assets. It is multifaceted. And that's what's beautiful about the Marine Corps in general is, you know, you have these opportunities to see how other MOSs work because you have to interact with those MOSs. You don't necessarily stay in your own lane, which I think is, is great. But bringing that around, you know, back, yeah. circling back around to the community is we're going from apples to oranges. So the most important part for my role is to make sure that we are being proactive as a community in order to take on this new, yeah. you know, vital role. Yeah. Do you also work with the L Mattis or so mainly Mattis? I am right now a mainly Mattis Mattis is a very extremely heavy ACAT 2 program, right? Yes. So we have noticed that, you know, throughout time, the emphasis where I could be best utilized is, is Mattis. However, I have obviously learned about El Mattis. Yes. I've done their new equipment training as well. As a matter of fact, when I first got here to Syscom, that's, that's one of the first things I did just to kind of get my feet in the water. I also work with... Uh, HSI, Human Systems Integration Team, if they ever need anything for El Mattis or want my professional opinion on where things should be to make it more 
operable for the Marines, then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll add my two cents. But I don't really, I'm not very heavily divested. On a day-to-day, you're not on working on MLATIS. Yeah. What about, um, since you're in training, what about TCOM? Do you bring them in at all? Yeah, so uh, I have had many initiatives. I'm not going <laughs> to lie, right? In a humble perspective, I've had many initiatives to complete a lot of things. TCOM right now, we've got a, a, a good buddy of mine and, and I guess you could say colleague of mine, right? Gunnery Sergeant Swayze, who is the first in our MOS to be over there to be that direct representative of training. So I have had many conversations about him and, and tried or to him and with him to try to paint the picture of what is going on and the, the level of experience that I have in yeah. regards to training on my side to kind of filter that and decipher it through TCOM or TECOM to, to achieve the best end state for the schoolhouse and for the future of our, our MOS. So I would say yes, but my footprint there isn't very heavy right now too because my time is very consumed by Matt, yeah. right? Doing that. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Net, I mean, testing, you know, live firing, things like that. You've kind of touched on this, but is the training SME, are you going out and physically training Marines or do, are you just helping to develop the training program or both? So I think both. I think it's extremely vital to have what we call, right, green suitors, if you will, for, for, for short term here at CISCOM because we're mostly, mostly civilians. I, I believe it's extremely integral to have a Marine representative from CISCOM during these net events to, you know, lead, train, and mentor these Marines just because of the attitudes of Marines, you know, communicating and having that relationship with another one, right? Uh, So that's really where I play a heavy role is more of a more of a supervisory role when it comes down to new equipment training. Prior to the first one we did, I did review all, you know, 26 master lesson files and and helped basically develop that, if you will, by sending those net instructors to the OEM training and then reviewing the curriculum. But a lot of the times, and I love doing this, it's, it's more of the janitorial aspects. And by janitorial aspects, I, I love janitorial aspects because the smallest, most minute, intricate detail can be the make or break. Yes. Right? Yeah. So being able to anticipate those uh, or anticipate issues and finding solutions prior to them showing up, which would essentially degrade the training for the Marines, like that's, that's my bread and butter. That's what I, I enjoy doing. So that's where I kind of play a role. You know, okay. That's where I play a role when it comes down to that. And I, I miss Marine interaction. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Like working we're over g- here is amazing and it's beautiful opportunities, but I, I'm a Marine. I'm like, operational. Yeah. I love training Marines. Which that leads me to my next question for you. Um, you're a lad gunner. Mm-hmm. And you kind of talked, they, how did you, did you want to come and do training? How did you end up at PEO? Funny story. <laughs> so, you know, funding is important. Uh, sending Marines where they need to go is important as well. Yes, yes. And uh, so I was over at the Martial Arts Center of Excellence, working a few roles over there. I was teaching a lot of Marines in these programs and, you know, playing, playing a pretty vital role over there. That was kind of my B billet, right? That was my additional billet. Um, so a lot of people will go drill instructor recruiting, uh, you know, MSG, things like that for their additional billet. Whereas I went over there and I became a form, advanced formal schools instructor. So I got a phone call one day from Master Guns T, Master Guns Turlaki, who was basically over at Syscom and CDNI, direct representative of my MOS okay. and the Oakfield manager. He gave me a call. I was coming up on orders. He was like, hey, hey, man, where do you want to go? And I said, you know what? Like, I'm at 11 and a half, 12 years at the time. I was like, needs of the Marine Corps. You know, yeah. I'm not going to argue where you send me. I have you know, where I would like to go, but regardless, grow where you're planted. And, you know, he kind of expressed to me that was a, that was a breath of fresh air. And, you know, yeah. like he could have sent me anywhere. He said, how does the program office sound? We need, you know, we've got this new program coming out. 
developed program that we're really pushing towards milestone C. And I really need a training representative over here. And with your background, like we could use that. And I was like, sign me guy. up. Like, you <laughs> yeah. know, needs the Marine Corps. Had no idea really what I was getting myself into. Kind of logged into the DAU community, defense yeah. acquisition, started digging through that, realized that there's a lot of associated <laughs> acronyms that also the Marine Corps has acronyms for. So it's <laughs> been a process of learning the acquisitions world. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm the best at it, but I believe nobody would say they're the best at it. Um, it's a lot to learn. It's yeah. a lot to learn. Yeah. So I, I really try to stay in my uh, my operational lane and and provide just as much validity and, and support as I can to our you know, our great G bad team, because we do, we, we have, I mean, I haven't been a part of any team, other team over here at Syscom, but we have an absolutely phenomenal team on this program. Y'all's team is pretty great. It is. I like it them. <laughs> yeah. Not that I have favorite teams, yeah, but. <laughs> yeah. No, I absolutely do. I'm biased. I mean, I'm a part of the program, so. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to work um, in low altitude air defense when you joined the Marine Corps? Yeah. So interesting story. I, uh, I joined the Marine Corps as combat support. Okay. And under combat support, you have um, artillery, used to be tanks. Uh, shout out to uh, retired Mass Sergeant Chewy here. It was a part of the program, came over and, and helped us develop. Love you. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to send um, him this episode. <laughs> that, yeah, that was a part of, you know, um, combat support and then air, air defense control community as well uh, and LAD. And when I joined, I thought I was going to be artillery, right? So, you know, all throughout boot camp and everything, I'm like, oh, 11 artillery. Yeah. And then I hit Marine combat training, which was a, you know, a seven, I think a seven week pipeline or five week pipe, pipeline at the time came to the end of that. And they're like, you know, reading off private Ross, uh, 7212 low altitude air defense gunner. You're like, what? (laughs) You know, same thing. I'm like, I have no idea what that is, but it sounds so cool. So I asked the sergeant, right? I'm like, sergeant, what is that? And he's like, oh, you're going to be a door gunner on a Huey. And I was like, oh, (laughs) sweet, right? I'm going to be flying. Like, this is great, you know? Took me back to the Vietnam videos, right? And the Vietnam, (laughs) you know, Vietnam uh, movies. And then I see my orders and it says Fort Bliss, Texas. And I'm like, what is in Fort Bliss, Texas? You're like, where is that even at? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, right there on the on the edge of Juarez, right? Um, and uh, so I fly in there, and lo and behold, I find out I'm absolutely not a door gunner on a Huey. I'm a uh, FIM-92 Stinger missile operator, essentially, providing low-altitude air defense to the Marine Corps. So okay. once they said that and went through the training pipeline, I'm like, great, this is my bread and butter, and we... We just kind of continued from there. And, uh, you know, I love it. I love it. Small community. It's easy to get a bad reputation. It's also very easy to get a good reputation, you know. So your your faith is kind of in your hands, just like anywhere else, right? But, you know, um, it's, it's really great. You can provide a lot to a small community like that. So I'm extremely happy to be a part of it. We've talked about the LAD community, but we haven't talked as much about LAD battalions and what their mission is. We've kind of touched on it, but can you give an overview? Because I'm, you've been at a few yeah, battalions. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like I, um, I've also uh, put my put my head through a lot. So I will I will sh- kind of short stint it, but essentially, you know, LAD battalions are there and lad gunners are there to provide ground-based air defense and air-based ground defense okay. right that it, that is right now with our what equipment we have that is our mission um depending on the ao depending on whether you're a part of second low altitude air defense or third low altitude air defense or as we know now first lad and third lab right littoral anti-air battalion like your mission sets and your area of area of operation is going to be different, which means that your uh, standard operating procedures are going to change and your TTPs and SOPs should kind of stay, you know, your tactics, trainings, procedures and and everything should should kind of stay the baseline. However, depending on the mission set, it, it will adjust. But, you know, as I was saying before, I mean, I, we are the the sole line, the last line of air defense. Uh, for the Marine Corps, you know, 
the threat is growing every day. So with that, we we develop things even more to to fit the need and, and beyond because that's what we do. You're critical to the future fight. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So and for a while, I mean, as we know, like we continued to sit, sustain and train, but the, the, the threat wasn't as relevant, you know, especially when I joined uh, in regards to superiority. Right. And now if you talk about, you know, depending on the level of threat, you know, we really need those assets. And that's exactly what we're doing. So you've been in for yes. a little while. 12 yep. years, 13? Uh, 14 now, oh. going just shy of 14 years. Okay. How have you seen technology change over time? Has it been a big change from where you were when you first joined to where we are now? I have absolutely seen, I, and I'll just specifically talk about my community and the, the assets that we've had. I mean, we went from, you know, passive air defense, early warning and queuing through a radio, like, hey, you have an aircraft coming over from this direction to this direction. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, you, you can orient your body and yourself. You're good enough. You know, you are skilled enough and have enough situational awareness to, to know where that aircraft is coming. Uh, you know, baseline would be that we're the we're the world's best hide and seek players from aircraft. So even if you didn't catch them, hey, you got a leaker report, but two, you know, you didn't defend your asset. But most majority of the time, like we would find a way and we would train to those abilities extensively with the technology that we had. You know, all the lethal way lethal then, lethal now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it again, it kind of reverts back to, yeah. and you can see where my mindset yeah. is at, right? It's all about the Marines. Yes. You know, the capability lies within the Marines and how much they are going to be knowledgeable and proactive at learning exactly how to execute these things. Um, but circling back around the technology, so that, that was kind of the baseline uh, of where where I started, right? Whether it was setting up a a fake position to kind of steer whatever uh, enemy or um, red cell that we had towards that position in order to have the tactical advantage. You're talking very archaic, right? Yeah. Eye to eye, tooth to tooth. However, where we sit, right, the technology that we have has absolutely increased our capabilities from joint range extension capability that we got, you know, a little later in my career where we could, you know, log into radars from our positions and, you know, be able to see where the aircraft are flying. And, you know, that's a huge asset from early warning and queuing yes. and just getting that, you know, those radio signals to like, oh, hey, I have this picture. I know where my teams are. I know where my defended asset is. And I also know my minimum risk routes and checkpoints where friendly aircraft could be flying. And it, it's just so much easier to decipher what's going on in the sky. It's a bigger picture that we have now than we had in the past. Absolutely. Yeah. And then leading up into Mattis, and I'm not going to dive too much into the capabilities of Mattis. However, it is extremely capable in regards to the C2 aspect of being able to have eyes on the sky, eyes on the ground, and direct situational awareness from a seat in a vehicle to being able to operate my weapon systems via remote weapon station. Also having the ability to direct my weapon systems via technology and, you know, to shorten the kill chain of anything that is, is you know, a potential threat. So the evolution of technology, if you will, is, has been exponential throughout our time. And just my generation alone, I mean, I went from a, you know, I went from a home phone to the world at my fingertips. So it's, it's really cool to see, see how you know, it's developed not only in, in my life, but in my, you know, in my occupation. You know, whenever I think of Lad sometimes, so I've been watching the show Reacher. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In the second season, how they're going after those launchers that they're oh, shooting them yes. from the ground. That's yes. always what I think about. Absolutely. With technology, and I, I guess I'll just mention this, you, with technology, you also have to make sure that your technology is not going to be compromised. Yes. Which we do a phenomenal job at. Which was a know? big topic in the show, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. And, and you know, it's a, it's a big real life topic and we do a, a, an extraordinary job to make sure that when we're developing these things, not only... 
you know, can we utilize them, but they, they're not going to be compromised. And then, you know? yeah, we're protecting the American public. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Do you have Marines uh, reach out to you directly if they have questions or does that happen a lot? Yeah. So yeah. absolutely. The first thing I do during that, right, is I write my, my name and my number up on the board and I let those Marines know, like, hey, I understand there's a chain of command, but if you have questions, especially if it's going to make you a better warfighter, like absolutely call me anytime, you know, and I've had quite a few Marines hit me up about those things, right, and contact me about those things, which I believe is extremely important, especially when it comes down to leadership, right? Manage Agreed. work, lead the people. Yeah, I think it's great that almost everyone here, they're, they're always open to giving out their phone number, their email to, to any of the operators and just being like, give me a call. I can help. We're always here to help. Um, yeah. Because they don't always know where to go if they right. have questions. Yeah. And it, it, I will say, like, I haven't, I've, been, I've been contacted quite a few times, but not as much as I would expect. And that makes sense. I mean, the interaction between a Lance Corporal and Corporal and Gunnery Sergeant can be a bit intimidating. Yeah. Uh, however, like I have emphasized multiple times, like that open line of communication is extremely vital to, to not only your success, right? Because we talk about our individual success, but our success as a team the in order to execute our mission, you know, and that's what we focus on. You mentioned earlier that the MATA system is leveraging existing capabilities and bringing them all this disparate pieces together to make this system. How, has that made training easier and sped up the acquisition process? Yeah. I mean, there, there are assets or things on that vehicle that people have a resident knowledge in. And not only that, but they're more capable now, but the level of training stays the same, which is phenomenal. Okay. I would say it, it has accelerated the program if you were to put, you know, minutes on a scale and hours on a scale. Yeah. It has absolutely assisted with that process to include, you know, some of the Marines and, and our units, our lab units have this equipment. So they're very familiarized on it, you know, and not only that, but they've utilized this equipment on past versions of Mattis. So it's really cool to see that we are sticking with the same construct with a, with a few things, but advancing our capabilities with those same or upgraded pieces of equipment. Like Marines have been, sense. yeah, because yeah. Marines have been working with stingers for yep. a while now. And Absolutely. that's still part of how we're doing air defense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they know the capabilities and, and limitations of that weapon system. Now it's just, you know, mounted on a vehicle yeah. and operated differently. Um, and our team has done a, a you know, phenomenal job at making it as user friendly and as button friendly as possible. Right. The buttonology is extremely important. So, um, yeah, it absolutely has assisted not only in the training aspect, but the acquisitions aspect. Is there anything you would want to see from industry in regards to lab? Yeah. So this is a tough one. Right. Because I could go on for days and days and days about what I would like to see from industry. I guess the most broad and holistic approach I can is I can put in regards to air defense and industry is just provide us with solutions to our current issues with the best possible equipment and technology that you can for the yeah. military. And I know that's super broad and I know that's the mission, but I would just like to emphasize that point because it's extremely important to stay focused on the nation's defense, you know, for industry to stay focused on the nation's defense and, and the way of life that we live um, and defending that way of life. So that's what I would offer industry is, you know, from the egocentric level to the, to the ethnocentric level, you know, really focus in on that and continue to make that your mission. Remember why we do what we do. Remember yeah. exactly. Don't ever lose sight of why, you know, of what, you are producing for the warfighter, right? 
Uh, and again, it's a nation's defense. So that's important to take into consideration. Let's take a break from talking about the work you're doing with Mattis and let's talk about you for a bit. Okay. Who is Gunny Ross? Goodness, what year, what time? <laughs> I mean, where? <laughs> yeah. um, where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from New Gloucester, Maine, small town in southern Maine, born and raised, small town. I think I went out of Maine like once a year to New Hampshire and one time to Florida for a Disney World trip when That's I was it. like 10. And like that was it, right? So anything, if anybody knows anything about Maine, 20 years behind, right? I lived in Bath for a little while. Okay, yeah. yeah I yeah. loved it though. Oh, it's beautiful. It was That's, great. Yeah. I actually walked to school in the snow uphill. So I make sure to tell, as I'm doing it now, I make sure to tell people that all the time. If Absolutely. a kid complains, I'm like, I don't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uphill both ways barefoot. Yeah, it yeah. was. Uphill yeah. both ways, not quite sure how that's yeah, possible. But it happened. It, but yeah, I mean, which one, which route is longer, which one is shorter? That's what I want to know. Did you walk to school in the snow? <laughs> I did. I See? actually walked to work in the snow as well wow. when I graduated. So That's impressive. Yeah, grew up in the snow. I miss it. I really do. People are like, what? No. You're, you like fun. to snowboard and ski and That's all that it. too, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And a very big outdoor enthusiast. Any type of extreme sports as well as camping, fishing, hunting, just getting out in nature. You know, it's therapeutic. Yes. It really is. Yeah. Um, why did you join the Marine Corps? Yeah, I guess I would say I'm not going to try to take the approach of like, you know, um, you know, back in the olden days when people had a choice between prison and, and, <laughs> and the Marine Corps and they chose the Marine Corps. But I mean, I was not the most well-behaved kid, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's important to emphasize for, especially for the listeners out there. Like, I was not the most well-behaved kid. I, I went through a lot. Um, I was homeless for a year before I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, kind of put myself there as the, you know, adolescent kid that I was, but I saw an opportunity and I knew, I knew I had potential. I, I had done a lot of good things. I was just really burnt out from the area and the small town aspects. Yeah. And I really wanted a, a second chance to prevail and really not prove to myself or prove to anybody, but basically a, a second chance at success. Uh, and I, you know, I really tried to focus in on capitalizing on that. Yeah. And I love acts of service. I love to serve, right? That's literally, a, you know, that's a huge language of mine, if you will, that really feeds my energy. So uh, I latched onto it. And, you know, my first four years, I was like, well, really not many deployment opportunities. We had some news, right? But Afghanistan was dying down and everything for my community in specific. And you know, I was like, well, I told my chain of command, Lance Corporal, Matthew Ross, right? Told my change man. Little like, Maddie. Yeah, little <laughs> Maddie, right? I was like, hey, you know, I need to deploy in these five, like four years. I'm working, I'm doing everything I possibly can. I'm talking to a gunnery sergeant and a mass sergeant. And back then, like, you typically don't have a lance corporal talking to these yeah. individuals, especially in a combat support or combat MOS. And, you know, of course, I got yelled at, right? <laughs> and, and I'll say it one time and one time only, butt chewings are free. <laughs> right. Let's just say that. But you are free and you learn something. Yeah. You know, I learned something from them at that time. Here I am, a Lance Corporal saying, like, I'm doing everything I possibly can to to get out of here and get on a deployment. And if I don't, I'm not reenlisting. And it was funny because I would receive that negative feedback. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, you're on this. You're welcome. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So at that point, I, you know, I, man of my word, I told I told myself at that point I would do 20 years, and that's what I'm doing. I'm doing 20 years. My, the Marine Corps will get all of my gas tank and all of my battery power within those 20 years. And then I will pat myself on the back and be proud of myself and continue on. <laughs> Have you thought about what you want to do after? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so right now I've got a few, few endeavors going on, but I want to create a mental resiliency and survival course for troubled youth and recovering drug addicts. So that that's one, great. yeah, that's one of my massive initiatives that I have. Uh, one of my blueprints that, you know, I really want to achieve and I kind of do 
background work on it. Uh, I don't put emphasis on that, obviously, because yeah. <laughs> Marine Corps is, is my priority right now. And You're and, a little busy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but, you know, live to serve. And that's that's a big direction that I'm working towards, you know, rolling over into taking taking the experience and everything that I've gone through in the Marine Corps and kind of translating that. How I, How can I help? Right. How can you take what you've learned and help other people? Absolutely. If you talk about sustaining the transformation, which is massive when it comes down to the Marine Corps, is what what does the Marine Corps do? Whether it's FTAP Marines or STAP Marines, right? They create as as if you will better civilians, right? So that is one of the missions. And how we do that now as a leader is how do I support somebody that is transitioning? So it's just cool. I love that philosophy. And I want to continue that on and support a, a greater cause uh, in regards to these kids that are don't necessarily have the direction. Uh, so they might just need a little help. Yeah, just yeah, a, little. a little help. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You mentioned that you were at McMap. Yes. Prior to coming here, um, do you have a favorite type of martial arts that you like to do? Uh, I I wouldn't say favorite type of martial arts. I favor stand up. Right, standing and striking. I okay. Favor, uh, using my hands and feet, I would say it's probably so not the art of eight limbs, Muay Thai. <laughs> no, I mean Muay Thai boxing, uh, kickboxing, um, Taekwondo, like just that. Not like the grappling on the ground. That t- yeah, no, I, yeah. I'm not <laughs> saying I'm not saying I don't enjoy that. Right. I'm just saying I'm. Not as good at it. <laughs> oh, okay, right? okay. So I think I enjoy stand up more. I enjoy striking more okay. than um, than ground. But again, that's today. You know, it, my my mindset could shift eventually. But martial arts is beautiful. It it really provides you a lot of discipline, and the Marine Corps does it right. in the fact that we train ethical warriors, right? So we're not out there training people to, uh, to be you know, bad, if you will, and walk into a bar and, and, beat and, people up. and say, yeah, I can take that guy. I can take that guy. But essentially the, the philosophy truly is like anywhere I go, people are more protected. Yes. Right. And, yeah. and in order for a Marine to have that mindset and you, you instill that into their leadership, you're just, again, creating a better quality of life for that Marine and those Marines around them. Yeah. That I like that you say that because Everyone, my I'm training in Muay Thai, you know, and yeah, 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 and my friends are like, oh, so you can beat people up, and I'm like, no, so I can protect myself, like yes. I, and it's like it's just a calming experience, so it is. yeah, it is absolutely, and it, you know, there, it has a lot to do with energy. I mean, I've dealt with a lot of hostile situations, and for you to be able to remain calm is profound. It's in, in those situations. It's difficult. You have to work on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, we do it right. That That's really where I enjoy it. You know, shout out to retired Colonel Shusko and, and the old McMap team. Um, you know, phenomenal experience. Um, that was a, an absolute profound time in my career uh, to work there. And, and it developed me a lot. Right. Do you still practice or not as much? I have not in the past two years. I am probably extremely rusty. So I could take you in sparring probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you know what? It is what it is, right? I'm willing to learn, you know? Uh, but no, I've, I've recently, so I've got a few MRIs done and stuff oh. uh, recently. So I'm just trying to get back cleared and get back into it, right? Get back into the swing of things and really dive into the, the ethics aspects and and you know, the, the ethical warrior aspects and tie back in with the, the friends. And another thing, I'm going back to the fleet, right? So I want to make sure, you know, if I'm wearing, uh, I'm wearing stripes or tabs on my belt, like one belts, hold up your pants, right? It's, it, it's yeah. about the leadership that you, you provide. But like, if I'm going to wear something and I've gone through that, like I'm, I want to provide the Marines with that, yeah. or I don't wear the belt. I don't you see what yeah, I'm get, saying? Yeah, yeah. It's not for You want to be able to give back. Absolutely. And the same thing goes with Marine Corps Instructor Water Survival. Like I just recertified the other day. And then Force Fitness as well. You know, I, I've worked hand in hand with that, with that uh, team and been a part of that team. So just tools in the toolbox to develop the Marines. I love doing that. 
Tell me about your family a little bit. Okay, yeah. So I have an eight-year-old son, Nicholas. Nicholas. I absolutely love him. Um, of course, he's my son, my little <laughs> handsome man, my little mini-me. Uh, and then I have my five-year-old daughter, Evelyn, who is 100% my actionable payback. <laughs> uh, Nicholas is more of an emotional payback. And when I say payback, it's a beautiful yeah, thing, right? Yes. Any, any parent out there really knows that your kids teach you more in life than anybody ever will, right? You think it's your parents. Well, you're actually teaching your parents, right? <laughs> um, so it's important to take that into consideration. But uh, yeah, I'm absolutely blessed. Absolutely blessed. They are uh, the light of my life. Uh, I've got a wonderful girlfriend as well um, who is unbelievable. I, I am extraordinarily blessed. Uh, I really have a, a phenomenal, you know, a phenomenal life. I do miss my kids a lot. They do live up in Maine. Oh, that's um, rough. For, for now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, military, military life is not easy. No, right? It's not. It's really not. And it's hard on kids. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so it's just important to take into consideration. And they understand, right? Yeah. Daddy is in the Marine Corps. Daddy's serving the country. He travels a lot, this, that, and the other. Um, you know, not not saying I am I am not willing to adjust my career attributes and my career path to make sure that my kids are one hundred percent taken care of, of at all times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I truly am blessed, as you can probably see, though, especially for the viewers. I'm a very optimistic person. That's you are. Am, you so. are. I don't think I've ever heard you say a negative thing, um, which is breathtaking. Yeah. I would say I would say ten percent of the time, but when you catch me in that mode, it's it, you know I'm probably hangry, yeah, or you know I'm probably just everybody has it. Everybody has you a know? day yeah. when you're feeling a little yeah. bit like Eeyore. I don't bury it; it comes out <laughs> no. when it comes out. You know, <laughs> I feel my feelings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally okay, but yeah, no, my family life is uh, family life is good, very dynamic. This is everybody's favorite round. Um, we call it the lightning round. So I'll just ask you a question and then you just tell me the first thing that pops in your head. Okay. Okay. All right. What's your favorite ice cream? Black raspberry. If you could have an unlimited supply of one thing, what would it be? Freedom. What's something on your bucket list you haven't done yet? Skydive. Okay. What's your favorite TV show, book, movie, or podcast? Book would be Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen Covey. That's a good book. Perfect. Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. I've learned a lot. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah. I mean, this is a first time experience for me being on any type of podcast and super excited and I'm happy to be on Equip in the Core. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Equipping the Core. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcasting platform or on social media. We'd love to hear from you.